Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for this kind introduction. Really delighted to be here with you today. And thanks to Mila and M2D2 community for organizing this meeting today. So I will talk about geometric machine learning for uh, molecular medicine. Uh, throughout the talk, uh, there will be several projects that will be highlighted. And for all of those projects, we have public data sets and code bases and um, pre-trained models and hugging face spaces available uh, and linked to my lab website, uh, Zitnik Lab HMS Harvard EDU that you're welcome to check out. So molecular sciences to me are very exciting because I feel that they are at the front of um, in kind of driving the incorporation and adoption of AI in scientific discovery more broadly. And, and to that extent, we're seeing now AI to be increasingly integrated in scientific discovery across all stages of scientific discovery process to augment uh, uh, research, to accelerate research, and often to gain insights that would not be possible using traditional scientific methods alone. I think that there are tremendous opportunities in that area and so really excited about also where the field is moving and kind of this cross-disciplinary collaborations that are emerging. And so the progress is being made across different scales as well. We have heard today from earlier speakers on various um, uh, in exciting directions uh, in the area of modeling individual molecules or mo molecular complexes. And kind of in addition to that, there's also lots of interest and in development on modeling interactions as they also then give rise to networks and ultimately phenotypes, either at the molecular cellular level or entire human bodies. And so the process here is actually two directional. It can, in one way, we want to increase our understanding and drive scientific discovery. And we, we hope that eventually that could also help uh, with uh, inverse design where some of the novel mechanisms that are discovered could be applied uh, um, in, in a reverse manner. But for this talk and specifically today, I would like to cover two topics. And specifically, the first, in the first part, I will talk about um, multi-purpose AI models that are going towards direction in that can allow us to generate models that can handle a variety of therapeutic tasks in unified formulation. And the second part of the talk, I'll talk about what I refer to as broadly as contextual AI models uh, that pro can provide contextualized predictions that are tailored towards specific disease or cell states and are more actionable in the sense that they can more readily translate to downstream experimental invest investigation. So let's start with the first part. And much of the work that we are doing in this area is um, made available to therapeutic data commons. Therapeutic Data Commons is an um, international open science initiative that serves as a meeting point between, on one end, biomedical scientists who, and drug designers who know what are the current bottlenecks in drug discovery um, development, and on the other end, AI scientists who, when objectives are defined and where there are clear, high-quality data sets available, can really design powerful new algorithms to advance and address those bottlenecks. And the ultimate goal and mission of the commons is to support and facilitate algorithmic innovation, as well as ultimately advance therapeutic science. And, and so fundamentally therapeutic data commons uh, provides a unified ecosystem that, that we are considering to evaluate current AI capability in two big dimensions. First is across stages of drug discovery and development, meaning we go from early drug design, drug target identification, optimization to leads, to questions that arise in later drug development, in um, um, even post-marketing surveillance questions. And second, uh, questions that relate to um, therapeutic modeling across therapeutic modalities meaning inter interesting emerging new modalities that go beyond small molecule drugs are really exciting to, to investigate and start thinking from the, the sense of AI as well. And fundamentally to achieve this goal, TDC has two, four, four components. So first is that for each and every of the of ML tasks, and we currently have 24 that span these stages of drug discovery and development, we provide mathematical formulation of AI tasks together with multiple benchmark data sets and standardized leaderboards. Those leaderboards can help us identify what are best in class algorithms that currently exist for those tasks. And they're evaluated across the entire spectrum of performance metrics that go beyond measuring simple accuracy uh, and also touch metrics such as those re re relevant to deployment or implementation in practice. 
More recently, I would argue that becoming increasingly important to, to facilitate adoption of AI models is to release not only code, not only process data sets, but think of releasing pre-trained models. And so, uh, and so the therapeutic data commons has some of the pre-trained models that ongoing development for key therapeutic tasks are released. And finally, it also provides interactive human AI uh, interfaces through which experts do, who do not necessarily need to have exp experience in machine learning uh, and coding can interact with those models, get predictions, and in some cases provide feedback um, that can be incorporated into those AI models. We have seen numerous compelling uses of um, um, AI in tasks that are currently included in the commons uh, that range from molecular property prediction and optimization to questions related to geometric modeling of binding of novel drugs to candidate therapeutic targets in various generative tasks. And for the purpose of today's talk, I will focus on one specific compelling use and that's therapeutic, therapeutic use prediction, which is slightly different um, in its goals and data and algorithms uh, than uh, several of the other use cases that I think were wonderfully covered by our speakers this morning. So regarding therapeutic use prediction, here's the motivation for that. So what we are seeing is that biomedical data are generally generated and collected on very diverse set of entities. Uh, they, those readouts can be generated at the level of genes, uh, at the level of proteins encoded by those genes, at the level of regulatory elements, and they can be generated and recorded through different kinds of biomedical modalities. And so what we would like to have is we would like to have large AI models that would be trained on that data that is recorded from different modalities in a self-supervised manner so that they can then eventually solve new tasks, typically in zero-shot manner with no or very little amount of labeled data. So what I will um, describe in the next few minutes, I will walk you through a method that, and a model that we refer to as TXGNN, which stands for Therapeutics Graph Neural Network. That is a model that is trained on an integrated uh, multimodal uh, biomedical data set, which is a large knowledge graph that currently covers 17,080 clinically recognized diseases. And for each and every of those diseases, a large molecular uh, set of data sets collected around those, that disease. And it is trained in such a way so that once trained, the model can process various therapeutic tasks. And therapeutic tasks for us here mean tasks related to predicting indications, meaning for a novel drug or an existing drug, what are its potential uses, also known as indications. Um, and for, for this, uh, in, the, in, in a similar way, also predict contraindications, which are certain ph phenotypes that in which those drugs should not be um, used and not considered uh, for human treatment. And we all we want to do that in a unified formulation, meaning we want to have a single model and then borrow information across this entire range of 17,000 diseases. So the knowledge graph that is being used for TIGGEN and model is called Prime KG. It's precision medicine oriented knowledge graph that we have put in quite a bit of effort to compile over the last two years or so. Um, it's a large comprehensive knowledge graph that's publicly available. And importantly, I think a unique feature, that's, that there are two unique features. First is that it has in, in, in covers the entire range of human diseases. So in contrast to other knowledge graph, the focus is really that we want to cover a large number of diseases, primarily also those for which there are currently no existing treatments. And second, um, is that that knowledge graph can be easily updated when new data become available to the sense that we provide Python codes that one can easily run and generate a new version of prime KG at any point in time. And so existing research for predicting therapeutic use generally operates in the following sense. We have this large knowledge graph and fundamentally we're thinking of predicting associations or in the simplest case, you can think of that as links between some entities that represent drugs or candidate drugs and some entities that represent summaries of diseases. And the way this is generally done is that one develop a models of their own choice and then valid evaluates model performance by performing some random split across drug disease pairs. And we'll refer that as scenario A. And so under this scenario, many existing methods perform really, really well. So we can take a state-of-the-art MPNN, um, uh, 
And we can see that in doing so, the model can perform uh, very well, in achieving AUPRC that goes beyond point eight in prioritizing for a given disease, uh, producing a ranked list of candidate therapeutics, such as those close to the top of the predicted list, are um, uh, highly likely to be either in, to be indicated or in an opposite direction to be contraindicated for their disease. However, what we are really more interested in are other scenarios, in particular scenario that I will refer to here as scenario B. And scenario B is, I, I think, reflects the scenario where there is a real important need and uh, an opportunity for AI models to be helpful, and that is making predictions around diseases that have very few or known existing treatments. Those might be rare genetic diseases where there's little financial incentive from big pharma to be developing novel drugs. Some of very complex diseases that are now thought of as being more a mixture of many diseases which we cannot fully understand well, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and others. And so the problem with, uh, with prediction in those settings is that these diseases that can tend to be very poorly understood are have very sparse or non-existent information. So there is sparsity of edge, a sparsity of information around those diseases in this local neighborhood of the knowledge graph. And so, but really that scenario B is where we would like our models to perform well, because that's where they can provide most guidance to experts. And so really, if we now evaluate existing methods under this scenario B, we can see that performance drops considerably. It drops to the level that the model become really not helpful or not of sufficient quality that could be reliably used for hypothesis generation. So the challenge becomes, can we train models in a way that we will be able effectively to transfer information from diseases that are under scenario A that um, are more better understood that have some existing therapies to those diseases with very little scars uh, therapeutic information. Um, available. And ultimately, the, the way we'd like to do that is to make, be able to make prediction even for diseases with known treatment. So we want to have models that can predict in a zero-shot manner. So TIGGEN and the model is a model of that kind. So, so it consists of two big components. So the first is um, a neural message passing uh, strategy that is, uh, that is tra trained and optimized on prime KG knowledge graph. And what we found in doing so is that in, or, in order to improve the transferability of the model, it's important to consider information that goes beyond relational or graph structured information around the diseases. And that is what the model uh, can integrate as well through, through a, a fusion strategy that can bring together in, information around disease mechanisms and disease signatures together with latent representations that are optimized on the knowledge graph in order to generate better embeddings uh, for diseases as well as for candidate therapeutics. So the guiding principle of how the model operates and the guiding principle for several of projects in, in my group are the fact that for many complex diseases that are diseases that are not Mendelian in nature, they are generally controlled by more than one gene. And even that might be even beyond that, that many those genes can have different kinds of patterns and different kinds of mutations uh, in different cells that lead to the same disease. So what effectively that means that we need to take a more network-based approach when we are trying to interpret and find a representation of how a disease looks like and what are then areas that one can target to therapeutics. So a way to interpret these genetic events is that we construct a, some form of network represent each and every disease that we refer to as a disease interactome. It generally consists of genes and other associated biomedical concepts that, that are dysregulated in the disease. And so then drugs can be thought of as or modeled as those external agents that target these small biological systems that represent diseases. And they target interactomes that are uh, larger than those that are encoded by single genes. And so in, in that sense, then we have much more flexibility and a broader view of how we can think of diseases as it does not become simply a set of genes that are associated with the disease onset and 
progression, but more broadly, it consists of additional biological processes and, and, and their dysregulation uh, that, uh, is, uh, um, that leads to the disease that a therapeutic can then mitigate. And so that's exactly what TIGGEN and leverage so that it learns these, these, these specific interactomes that are perturbed in disease across a broad range and in, of disease spectrum, and then effectively transfers that signatures of those disease models from one disease to the other. Specifically, then we are interested in if we can do that well when making a transition to disease that is very poorly understood. So that effectively means that we want to evaluate TIG gene and performance on new diseases that were not encountered by the model during training time, and even disease areas that the model has never seen before. And so that I'm showing here on the right part of the slide, evaluation of TIG gene model under these two scenarios that we discussed before, scenario A and scenario B. And under scenario A, we see some lift in performance offered by teaching and model, but the part that we're more excited about is scenario B, which is the lift in performance by the model when it is asked to prioritize therapeutics for diseases that currently don't have any treatments. And that's most significant because prevailing algorithms all rely on the assumption that for a given disease, there are already many or some existing treatments. And then the question becomes, can we effectively learn a good metric that could co correlate chemical compounds to each other and then transfer that to new disease? So when there is no, there are no existing treatments for the disease, it becomes really challenging for existing method to perform well. Now we can split the data in numerous different ways and we are seeing that TGGN improves over existing for, for methods quite substantially by leading to 49% uh, improvement in uh, higher accuracy in predicting indications and or 35% improvement in accuracy predicting contraindications. And it can do so when it is exposed to entire class of diseases or disease areas, such as disease of cell proliferation or disease of adrenal gland that the model has not seen before. And here performance is evaluated as recall at 100, meaning that we ask the model to make top 100 predictions and then evaluate what percentage of those uh, are potentially valuable. Regarding novel predictions that the model make, that's always something that we, we, we want to do to evaluate if model can potentially generalize beyond the, the, um, the kind of existing knowledge in science, and also whether it can perform well in settings where we have control over data leakage and, 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 and related biases. So here we ask model to make novel predictions for um, entire disease range. And then our hypothesis was that if novel predictions of therapeutic use are of any value, we would expect that those predictions are consistent with off-label prescription use in large EHR systems. So those are, uh, those are the usage of drugs that are used in an off-label manner, currently not approved by FDA, but are done by clinicians at their own, um, uh, at their own decision. And we, we would expect that our null predictions made by the model, if helpful, should be consistent somewhat with what the model says. So here we teamed up with our collaborators from Mount Sinai Hospital, and we analyzed with them 1.2 million electronic health records of patients across 480 diseases and 1,200 drugs. And there is a tremendous amount of background data processing here. But what we eventually found out is that if you look at top one, top five, or top 5% predictions that are, that are made by the algorithm, the enrichment of those predictions in off-label prescription use is comparable to the enrichment we would see if we compare uh, our model predictions with FDA approvals. And so that indicates strong potential of, of uh, those novel predictions as potentially being therapeutically valid. Uh, TGNN can also predict therapeutic use for recent FDA approvals. And because we can log prime KG knowledge graph at any point in time, we can really simulate these retrospective studies. And here I'm showing one example where we did that for um, June 2021, and then ask the model to make predictions after that date and compare those predictions to recent FDA approvals. One thing that is important for us, in addition to model and algorithmic development, is to think about ways to provide 
uh, those these algorithms are tools to end users, which in our case are biomedical scientists, genetic counselors, uh, clinicians. And so to that extent, we developed an interface that we call the UGNN Explorer that's publicly available at UGNN.org that supports scientists in interacting with AI predictions and interpreting conclusions of AI analysis. And so that entails not only providing static prediction lists, but also providing explanations that the model is using for making uh, predictions. And so we have found that there are based that it's not only important to present some of these additional information to users, but also think about how that additional information is presented. In particular, path-based explanations that we define as um, long sequences of biomedical concepts that relate query drug and query disease have been most informative for the main experts in, in, in evaluating our predictions. And so the way we approach that is by carrying out a usability study uh, with diction and predict, uh, not predictions and compare outputs of the model to a model where there are no explanations provided um, and do did the evaluation across several usability questions regarding the accuracy that uh, with which humans can make decisions about uh, the uh, about the therapeutic hypothesis with or without uh, model predictions, with and without model predictions and explanations, the amount of time it takes them to make an informed decision whether a prediction is trustworthy, as well as user confidence and user agreement questions. And so that model is currently released uh, and, uh, and uh, you're more than welcome to try it out and also let us know about what your feedback is. In the second part of the talk, I will uh, change the focus a bit and um, speak on the use of uh, contextual AI models with a particular focus on enabling or kind of moving away from the systems wide perspective and enabling more precise predictions whether a specific therapeutic candidate is more or less suitable for patients of a specific profile and whether that candidate also can behave differently across different disease and cell contexts. So here's the motivation for this work. And we can think of words or genes and the pro protein products that those genes encode in, in somewhat corresponding manner. So the meaning of words and as well as the meaning of genes arise from their context. So we can take the word apple, it's a polysemic word. We can grow an apple, we can buy an apple. And the meaning of the word apple really is, depends and it's resolved via this sentence context. So the same is true in biology. We can take a gene, H2AFX, and that's pleiotropic gene, meaning that the function, the role that the gene and its gene products will perform in a cell are resolved by a cell context. So the same, the same biomedical entity can have different role and function in different contexts. Now those contexts can be defined in different ways. They can be different groups of cells or disease states, or in this specific uh, uh, example here, the contexts are defined as environments that are, um, that are defined by specific chemical compound between which um, that uh, gene uh, um, and uh, cell expressing that gene is found. And so with that understanding in mind and the importance of resolving the function of uh, molecules by considering biological context in doing so, we um, embarked on a project where we are interested in contextualizing protein representations and use as context large molecular single cell atlases. So we are seeing an incredible amount of, uh, of really remarkable algorithms that can learn powerful protein level representations. And I think those are great algorithms. And generally they provide the number of embeddings that they provide if you are limiting to those proteins that are encoded by genes is that you get one embedding, one signature latent representation per protein. What we argue is that that's not sufficient, that we can do much better by providing a number of those signatures for the same protein across different contexts or cell types. So the project we developed is called AWARE. Um, that approach is based on the data, which is um, integrated um, protein human reference protein interactome network that's integrated with molecular cell atlas that comes from tabula sapiens, which is the current reference human cell atlas. 
And once that network is uh, built, we develop a multi-scale geometric deep learning model that can generate those contextualized protein representations. So the way this works very briefly is that from the molecular cell atlas, we identify over 160 different cell types, which serves as biological context. For each cell type, we construct a cell type specific protein interactome, which are those pink blobs that you see on this slide. We then relate those cell type specific protein interactomes with each other based on known biological hierarchies. So it means that we have, in addition to cell type specific interactomes, we have these green nodes that represent cell types. Those cell green nodes representing cell types are connected to tissue nodes that represent human tissues. And tissues are connected to each other based on a tissue hierarchy. Cell types are connected to each other based on the strength of communication between cells in a given cell type. And so the, once we have this multi-scale network representation, what AWARE does is learns representations of proteins in each cell type specific network while adhering to these larger constraints. Meaning that for two proteins, say P1 and P2, if they are connected in a given cell type context, then their representations in their cell type will be pulled together. Whereas then representations of, uh, of, of proteins that are not connected within that cell types uh, specific network, their representations in their context, in that context will be um, repelled and, and pushed further away. And the same is true then at the cell types level and the tissue level. So we have this multi uh, scale hierarchical tissue embedding. I will wrap up with just one story on the use of this kind of protein contextualized protein representations because it now means that we can ask a questions that are related not only for a given protein, what its representation looks like, but for the same protein in different cell types, how does that representation potentially the function of the protein changes? So the specific use case that I will highlight relates to contextualized prediction around drug target nomination. So what we are interested in is then asking a question whether a specific uh, protein can be a strong candidate for a therapeutic area across those different biological contexts. The way this is done technically is that we use AWARE as a pre-training algorithm. And then once we have contextualized protein representations, we can fine tune them for this specific downstream task. And so the two downstream tasks that we consider here are two therapeutic areas. The first one is that of rheumatoid arthritis. The second is that of inflammatory bowel disease. For each of those two areas, we identify what are the existing drugs and drugs in development for the two of them and their mechanisms of actions, which help us identify a set of positive targets for each of those two areas and a set of negative targets, which were defined as proteins that are druggable and are considered as targets, but not for any disease in that same therapeutic area. So this was okay, then a harder uh, setup. So how do results look like? So let me explain how to interpret this plot. You can see that on the y-axis is um, average precision recall at top five, meaning that what we do is we ask the model to, uh, for a given therapeutic area, rheumatoid arthritis, to predict in, on a given a particular data set, um, a top five um, candidates and ask how many of those top five candidates are then known therapeutic targets for RA. And now we can do ask this question um, based on different data sets. And so what every dot in this plot shows a different biological context. We have one, over 160 contexts, which are 160 cell types. What, what this tells us is that there are certain cell types, certain biological contexts that are much more predictive of therapeutic targets than others. In contrast, if we don't consider context at all, which would be the current state of the art approach, performance we get is performance that either is at this bottom dra um, dashed gray line that represents models trained on a single human interactome that's not contextualized, or we can take a multi-model integrative approach that essentially just uses data across all 160 cell types in the best way possible. And we can get, in doing so, we can get, we can get to the levels that is achieved by a model that is shown here as um, a red dashed line. And we can see there are many biological contexts that are much better in their prediction performance. 
And then we can start asking questions for a given therapeutic target. Here I'm showing an example for ILS-6R, which is a, um, a target of uh, several of uh, anti uh, disease-modifying autoromatic drugs. What are specific cell types where that, uh, tar whether that target is more expressed and how informative that specific biological context and cell type is? Similar results uh, can be demonstrated uh, for uh, IBD, which is a different therapeutic area. And again, we see that biological context considerably improve predictive power of models to identify nominated therapeutic targets. So let me wrap up with my talk today. I covered two topics. The first was that on creating uh, multi-purpose models that can process various therapeutic tasks in a more unified manner. And second was that of contextualized AI models that can provide rep latent representations that are specialized to relevant biological context and demonstrated how that improves performance of pre uh, therapeutic models. Um, and so with that, I'm happy to take questions if there's time. Thank you. Uh, this was a really great talk and uh, really interesting to see how it was grounded in like uh, things that are relevant for the clinic. Uh, so I think it's uh, very interesting to see that. Uh, is there any question? Please feel free to walk to the mic. We have uh, a few more minutes to take them. Hello, thank you. It's a very interesting talk. Um, I have a small question. When you go back to, if you can go back to your graph where you show the your different cells with the APK, yes, yes. APR, sorry. Yes. We know that in uh, Atlas cell, we get way more representation of certain type of cells, mm -hmm. like immune cells. Mm -hmm. So is there any influence of the number of cells you would get in your uh, models at the beginning uh, in, in terms of result of the usual here and the APR? Results? So that's a, that's a great question. And it's particularly important given the current state of molecular cell atlases, where it's certainly easier to probe certain cell types uh, than others, which then can naturally lead to the kind of biases where the single number of cells instructed by experimental platform can vary by cell types. And that is a confounder rather than biological effect. So um, we are currently, um, so the, the results that I'm showing here were done with using tabula sapiens, which is a molecular cell class of half million human cells. We are currently working with uh, Chan Zuckerberg initiative on using their cell genes uh, data set, which has 43 million cells and a much better uniform coverage results. We have done here lots of sanity check analysis where we fix the number of cells per cell type and then repeat the analysis and then also reweight re and upweight certain cell types based on um, current limited knowledge of, of uh, the relevance of those cell types in certain tissue. So we try to mitigate some of the biases, but they are present, you're sure, you're right. Thank you. Right, uh, great talk. Um, sorry, I think I was asking too many questions today, but um, the, uh, the, this is your pro context-aware protein representations. Mm -hmm. um, these, are, these are latent representations of proteins at the sequence level or at the, uh, the protein sequence level, have you compared, for, mm -hmm. first quick question, have you compared those representations in some lower dimensional space to existing protein representations mm -hmm. for yes. specific functional tasks? And the second question very that follows up on that is now that you have these uh, context where protein representations, have you thought of seeing how these can connect to potentially predicting perturbation effects? So if you're you know, increasing levels of this protein or you're knocking it down, you're improve, uh, inhibiting it in some way, will it have an effect on say the cell state um, because you have those representations? Yeah, so both are great questions. So uh, we have done extensive benchmarking comparing these latent protein representations to those derived from other data modalities. There is just a rich body of literature of those latent representations trained based on sequence data or even structural information as, for example, has been highlighted in uh, other talks today. Um, and, and so we have those results. We're not, we're the kind of the pitch here is not on that being comp competitive because we know that there are um, certain phenotypes that are easier to predict from sequence data alone. There are certain that are not 
that are easier to predict from structured data. Now we have areas of proteins like chameleon sequences, which are like the same sequences, different folds. So all these different data modalities are relevant and taken together help towards better predictive power. The focus that the kind of the key you know, shift in the way we think about these models is that they need to be contextualized. So even much one is interested in learning sequence-based or structure-based protein representations, all of those can be contextualized. The second question regarding the use of these latent representations for modeling perturbations, that's a great point and we are actively working on this. Ruth uh, from Infinite Lex. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, when you refer to mutations, do you distinguish between somatic and germline mutations? Yes, we distinguish between those different kinds of mutations, um, both somatic and germline mutations, as well as then whether those are structural variants or single nucleotide variants, whether and in what regions of the genome they are found. Also, I assume to chimerism in the body, to chimerism in the body, where you have two kinds of sets. Sorry? Chimerism in the body when you have two sets of different uh, genomes in your body. Yes, so that's a great point. We currently don't have a solution for this problem. It's known as um, in, in store to be able to model mosaic mutations, if that's what you mean. Uh, but uh, we have some active collaborations in that area. So we certainly are very excited about extending these contextualized models first to a, a large, broader set of cell types. Currently, 500 distinct cell types in human body are, are really what is documented well. You know, human body has 37 trillion cells, so that's well beyond the, the scope we could handle. Um, and that's the first kind of first order biological context that we want to capture. But then we can cap specialize every protein representations learned for every cell type to then different disease states. And we know that certain diseases such as cancer are driven by um, uh, specific cell types. And so that then help us, and we have some early evidence that getting, taking these contextual rep representations, predicting response to novel therapeutic modalities such as immunotherapy can be very easily improved by an order of 50% by taking protein representations as learned for the biological context or cell type that's driving melanoma or say other uh, or, or say prostate cancer relative just relative to just working with agnostic or global protein reference interactomes that are not really indicative of any real cell state as it is in human body thank you